Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 81, The King in Brackets. If you've only listened to the last five episodes or so, you may be wondering whether this really is the history of the Germans, or whether you've accidentally stumbled into a history of Italy minus the charm and the humour of my karate. So today we will leave the shores of the Mediterranean to travel up north, though not with a train of mules carrying gold and silver, camels, dromedars, leopards and apes, as Frederick II did in 1235, the reason for that journey was nowhere near as joyous as the display of wealth and exotic animals suggests. It's a tale of a father and son relationship that went disastrously wrong. But let me not spoil this amazing story for you just yet. Before we start, I will today not remind you that the history of the Germans is advertising free thanks to the generous support of my patrons. You'll probably know this by now. What you will also know is that very occasionally I highlight other history podcasts that I enjoy and that I think you may enjoy as well. One of those is Anglo-Saxon England by Tom Cairns. Tom is a fully-fledged academic with an Oxbridge background and a PhD in Anglo-Saxon history, but do not let that stop you from listening. He is an excellent narrator who brings his stories to life and is the only one who's made me finally understand how all these little English kingdoms link up. If you like following the journey of a podcaster from an early stage, Tom's your man. He's on episode 28, so you can easily catch up. His podcast is called Anglo-Saxon England by Tom Cairns. Now last week, we took a possibly too detailed look at the constitutions of Melfi, Frederick II's great law book. I apologize if that was dragging on a bit, but I'm a lawyer by training and I cannot help myself. If law is not your thing and you've skipped after 10 minutes, here's the bit you need to remember. By 1231, Frederick had made Sicily into a state where, according to his enemy Pope Gregory IX, no man can raise a hand or foot without imperial consent. He had brought peace and justice to his kingdom and was collecting taxes to fund his bureaucracy and armies. In other words, the kingdom of Sicily was as stable and as well managed as it could ever be he now had the bandwidth to take charge of imperial affairs. The empire meant two things, northern Italy and its Lombard League for one, and the realm north of the Alps as the second one. It was the latter he was most concerned with in the first half of this decade. Frederick had left Germany in the hands of his oldest son and heir, Henry, in 1220. Henry had been elected and then crowned as King of the Romans, the title an emperor acquired before imperial coronation in Rome. Henry was born in 1211 in Sicily. His mother was Constance of Aragon, the first wife of Frederick II. He was only a year old when he was crowned King of Sicily, as had been requested by Pope Innocent III. Five years later, he's now six, Frederick called him and his mother to come up to Germany. We know nothing about the relationship between the father and son in these four years between 1216 to 1220, the only significant amount of time they will ever spend together his parents were probably not on brilliant terms. Frederick never had much regard for his wives. You may remember that previous emperors like Otto the Great, Henry II and Conrad II granted their wives significant roles at court and described them in their charters as sharing in the imperial authority. Barbarossa did not go that far but still recognized his wife Beatrix's importance as an imperial prince and as the mother of his children. Frederick II they take an almost oriental approach to his wives. Constance's successors were often confined to the women's quarters of the palace, rarely seen, and certainly without any political influence. Constance was a touch better off, probably because she was much older when she married 16-year-old Frederick, and she had come with important political and military connections. But that did not stop Frederick from maintaining liaisons with a string of women and fathering a whole brace of illegitimate children. These children and mistresses lived at court, which may have impinged on marital harmony. Whether that affected Henry, we again do not know. His father finally set off for Italy in 1220, and he left Henry behind to be brought up by imperial princes, loyal to the Hohenstaufen cause. The first of those was Archbishop Engelbert of Cologne. How much time Engelbert spent educating young Henry is unclear, 
nor do we know what kind of emotional support he received. Engelbert was a busy man. He was a member of the family of the Counts of Berg, whose main residence was confusingly called Schlossburg, which translates as Castle Castle. If you have grown up near Düsseldorf as I have, chances are you have made a school trip to Castle Castle, which is another 19th century reconstruction of rather dubious accuracy. Engelbert was a typical member of the 13th century imperial high aristocracy. He was very well versed in weaponry, he was extremely ambitious and not much interested in pastoral care. He was pursuing a policy all of his fellow imperial princes were following at the time, something called territorialization. What that meant is basically an extension of princely power, not just horizontally by acquiring more territory, but also vertically, i.e. consolidating and deepening their influence. Engelbert systematically pulled in rights and privileges that had been held by vassals or ministeriales and transferred them into direct archiepiscopal control. You remember that, say in the 10th century, it was common that multiple institutions would hold rights inside the same territory. Say the count, as a royal vassal, would be in charge of justice, but most of the land was held by another aristocrat as his private, allodial possessions. The bridge and its tolls were owned by the bishop, whilst the monastery operated the mills, coins in use maybe from the royal mint or from a completely different prince, equally a fourth one would have the right to claim tariffs for transport on the river, whilst the local bishop would refuse to pay any taxes or tolls based again on some royal privilege. What the imperial princes have been doing these last 200 years and will continue to do over the next 500 is to consolidate all these little individual rights and privileges until there's only one authority in each territory. Now that creates conflict. The local aristocrats were not happy being sucked underneath the control of an imperial prince. The same goes for the ministerialis who by now barely remember their servile status and have become almost indistinguishable from knights and other non-princely aristocrats. The other group of people unhappy with this were the burghers of the cities. Though most cities had been founded by imperial princes, in the 13th century they were increasingly rubbing up against the tightening grip of territorial powers. As the century progresses, free imperial cities emerge who, like imperial princes, are only subject to imperial vassalage and refute any interference by territorial lords. The city leagues are beginning to emerge, the most famous of which will be the Hanseatic League. For the major cities that had been the seat of a bishop, this creates an additional layer of conflict. We already heard that the city of Cologne occasionally pursued its own political objectives that did not always match those of the archbishop. But for now, the archbishop can still reside in Cologne and is not yet chucked out to live in Bonn. Engelbert, as I said, was in the midst of all this. His policy was to consolidate power in the Rhineland as well as in the Duchy of Westphalia and it was no different to what others were doing. But he had the advantage of being the guardian of the young king and also regent of the kingdom. When I said he operated no different from his peers, I mean he was happy to employ military might to get what he wanted. For instance, he fought two feuds with the Duke of Limburg over his family's inheritance. As was typical at the time, the bloody conflict did not end with the defeat of either party, but with a ritual reconciliation and compromise. The Duke and the Archbishop embraced and an agreement was signed whereby the Duke got an annual subsidy and the right to inherit after Engelbert's death. But the family lands were Engelbert's for now. Now the use of brute force in the pursuit of territorial or financial gain was common, and as we see from this, had limited downside for the main protagonists. Once military capacity was spent, the parties almost always reconciled, and if anything may lose a little bit of their possessions or reputation. Risks may be manageable for the principals in the conflict, but they weren't zero. Sometimes even a mighty archbishop and regent of the empire can fall victim to the reckless and brutal politics of the age. In 1225, one of Engelbert's vassals, the Count of Isenburg, had decided to kidnap him, presumably to force him to concede on some contested issue. He and his men ambushed the prelate when he was travelling from Zost to Cologne. But things went wrong. 
and the archbishop refused to come along quietly. Engelbert was nearly six foot tall and well versed in the use of weapons. The count lost control of the situation and his minister Jalles cut down the archbishop. Modern forensic analysis of his bones showed that he received more than 50 blows with sharp metal objects. That was sufficiently bad behavior to bring about repercussions for the count who was caught and beheaded. Engelbert, as you would expect, became a saint, at least in Cologne. And so, once the saintly Engelbert headed up to heaven, so ended the first period of guardianship of young Henry. Henry was now 14 years old. At that age, his father had taken personal responsibility of the Kingdom of Sicily, so Henry might have expected something similar, at least a transition towards personal rule with a less intrusive guardianship. But that was not forthcoming. Instead, his father appointed Ludwig, Duke of Bavaria, as the new guardian and regent. You may remember him. He is the same Ludwig who did move across to the papal side in 1228 and ended up defeated by young Henry, only to die under mysterious circumstances two years later. Henry was not happy about having another guardian, nor was he delighted when his father arranged for him to marry Margaret, a daughter of the Duke of Austria, who was seven years his senior. When Henry's minority formally ended in 1228, the relationship between father and son wasn't off to a good start. It improved a bit when Henry defeated Ludwig of Bavaria in 1229, thereby significantly improving Frederick's position vis-à-vis the Pope, but things became difficult quite rapidly. I gave you all this rundown about Engelbert, not just because it reminded me of a rain-sodden afternoon in my childhood, trotting up to Castle Castle with my schoolmates, at least one of whom I think listens to the podcast. Hi Ulf! The reason we went through all this is to show how Henry's view of the political realities of his kingdom was shaped. Henry had grown up as a German prince. Not just that, but as the elected and crowned king of the Romans and future emperor. His tutors would have told him about the lives of all the Henrys before him. Henry the Fowler, who had brought the fragmented kingdom back together. Henry II, who built the kingdom of God. Henry IV, who fought and fought and fought against the princely overreach. Henry V, who had concluded the Concordat of Worms that had given him at least some influence on the bishops, a right lost since his father traded it for his election, and his grandfather Henry VI, who had set off for Sicily, hoping to gain the resources needed to force the German princes into submission. Then outside his window he sees firsthand what has become of the empire. Imperial princes were filching more and more of the royal lands. The revenues of the king had dwindled as tolls, tariffs and mints had moved from the royal purse to the counts, dukes and bishops. No longer could a ruler call the knights of the realm to ride against his foes. No, he had to ask the imperial princes to provide those forces. The vassals only swore an oath to their territorial lord, not to the king any more. Meanwhile, in neighbouring France, the king had first taken over the former edge of an empire and was now busy wiping out the counts of Toulouse in the south. In France, every subject was swearing fealty to the king, except obviously in the lands the king of England still possessed in Aquitaine. Henry believed that it was his job description to bring the kingdom back together, to consolidate royal power and to become a new Henry the Fowler or Barbarossa. He even had an idea on how to do it. He had natural allies, the cities, the lower nobility and the ministeriales. All these people were losing out in the drive towards territorialization. The problem with these allies was that they were individually not very powerful. Henry had resources of his own, the Duchy of Swabia and the family lands in Alsace and along the Main River, all the way into Bohemia. And after the fall of Henry the Lion, he was, individually, the most powerful of the territorial lords. But that was not enough. He needed some allies, some bishops, some dukes, some margraves, landgraves, you name it. Now these guys had zero incentive to sign up to a political programme, that was trying to roll back all the gains his guys have made since the death of Henry VI. In fact, it was near suicidal to sign up for such a policy. Territorialization was entirely binary. Either you and your clan become the territorial ruler, or the subject 
of a territorial ruler. Any family that did not make it to imperial prince by 1250 disappeared from the front line of German politics for good. But the princes had an Achilles heel, money. Most of them were perennially broke. Being a territorial lord is expensive business. First up, there's a need for bling. The princes would compete over who had the most splendid courts. In Marburg, Mainz, Cologne or Vienna, an endless sequence of tournaments, feasts and festivals displayed the power and importance of these local lords. Knights would relish in the opportunities to display chivalric valour and courtly love. Men and women wore increasingly tight clothes, and the men in particular went on to display their shapely legs by cutting open their trousers. A well-formed quad muscle was the six-pack of the 13th century, and the girls were equally willing to display their assets in ever more daring garb. Before you think medieval love was all platonic longing, playing the harp below a tower and dying in defence of the honour of the maiden, here are some verses from Walter von der Vogelweide, one of the greatest minnesänger. Under the linden tree, on the heath, where we shared a bed, there you may find beautiful to look at broken flowers and grass, near the forest and the vale. Tundra die, beautiful, sang the nightingale. I came to meet him in the meadow. There my beloved had come before me, such I was received, O queen of heaven, that I would be blessed for ever. Did he kiss me? Probably a thousand times and some. Tundra die, how red my mouth is. If someone knew he lay with me, God forbid, for shame I'd die. What we did together, I don't want anyone to know, except for him and me and a little bird. Tundra die, but he won't tell. Now, that frill was, however, not the biggest expense. That was the cost of acquisition of new territories, rights and privileges. Sometimes it was done by force, which required the hiring of mercenaries, or at least the cost of keeping the ministeriales and vassals supplied. In other cases, it was simple, outright purchase. On occasion, say, a juicy deal comes available or a rival invades your territory, money needed to be mobilized quickly. The only ones who could do that were the money men from the Italian cities, from Bologna, Siena, Florence, Lucca or Asti. They had learned about money transfer during the Crusades, when princes and knights needed to have funds sent through from home. This infrastructure and experience with bill of exchange and pledges of land and assets were now put to good use. The bankers offered ready access to money to any prince happy to pay extortionate interest and pledge their property. Lending to the spiritual lords, the bishops and abbots was particularly attractive. Under church law, a priest could only borrow with the consent of the pope, since the security was unalienable church land. Lenders would demand the papal authorization and usually a commitment that the whole church would guarantee the debt, that in case of failure to pay, the Pope would automatically excommunicate the borrower. That made loans to bishops and archbishops cheaper, but at the same time the bishops and archbishops became more and more dependent upon the Pope. The counter to that rise in papal influence would have been imperial money. Sicily was enormously rich, and with this money a king of the Romans could have bought himself enough bankrupt princes to roll back the tide. So that was the plan. Bring together the lower nobles, the cities, and buy some imperial princes with Sicilian money and roll back the last 25 years of declining royal authority. It was a sound plan. Any king or emperor who had grown up north of the Alps, a Barbarossa or Henry IV, would have looked to implement exactly such a plan. From where they came from, it made perfect sense. There is a problem with this plan, though. The emperor was Frederick II, and he did not come from where his predecessors had come from. He had come from Sicily. If you look at the world from Palermo, it looks very different to the world you see from the Pfalz of Gernhausen. When Frederick had first come to Germany in 1212, his main objective was to prevent any future attacks on his kingdom of Sicily. The crown as king of the Romans was in his eyes more of an insurance policy than a central tenet of his reign. This perspective shifted after his coronation as emperor and then the reorganization of Sicily. With his position in southern Italy now secured, he could direct his ambition towards imperial matters. 
When he, Frederick, thought about empire, he did not see Otto the Great or Henry III or Barbarossa, he saw Caesar, Augustus, Trajan and Constantine. In his view, the emperor is not just the ruler of the three kingdoms, Germany, Italy and Burgundy, but the emperor is the monarch who rules over all the world and all the other monarchs, the Reguli, the little kings. There are two swords granted by Gaunt, the spiritual sword, the one made of words and sacraments that is to be wielded by the Pope, and then there is the temporal sword, the one made from iron, to be gripped firmly by an emperor. This concept may be ancient and broadly in line with church doctrine, but by 1230 the popes had moved on from there to a notion that the spiritual power of the church stands above the temporal rule of the kings and empress. They are to take orders from them. If Frederick wanted to make his vision real, conflict with the papacy was inevitable and his main concern. Frederick knew that. He also knew the key to this conflict lay in Italy, and now that Sicily was his, that meant in northern Italy. The imperial hold in northern Italy had weakened since the days of Henry VI, and his father, the relationship between the Empire and the Lombard League had been almost cordial. After all, Henry VI celebrated his marriage in Milan. But that is now 35 years ago. In the meantime, the Lombard cities had stopped paying the agreed imperial taxes and returned to their previous pastime of endless internecine warfare. Internally, the Italian cities were riven with factions, the Ghibellines and the Guelphs. The Ghibellines were socially members of the city aristocracy, not the aristocracy of money, was the land-owning, sword-wielding aristocracy who in Italy lived inside the cities in their enormous noble towers, not in castles on the land. They were broadly supportive of the emperor. The Guelphs were recruited mostly from the emerging class of merchants and bankers. They were loyal to the Pope, not for particular religious reasons, but because the church was not only rich, but also a heavy user of the emerging banking industry. The papacy would play these factions by awarding the business to merchants in Gulf cities and withdrawing it from cities that had shifted back to the Ghibellines. If Frederick wanted to tip the balance in his favour, he needed to support the Ghibellines, politically, financially, and above all, militarily. Militarily, he could count on his Sicilian army, but that was not enough. He needed reinforcements from the north. He needed the imperial princes. They were the ones who could muster a few thousand knights to help his campaign in Lombardy. The last thing he wanted was the princes to be tied up in a protected struggle with his son. It simply was not the right time to fight for royal rights in Germany. Italy first, Germany second. As far as Frederick was concerned, Henry should put his ambitions on the back burner and work to support his father. But neither of them seems to have comprehended the other's position. They had not seen each other since Henry was nine years old. He did not know him, he did not know his friends, or what he thought about the world. And then there's the language issue. Henry spoke German, not as his mother tongue in the formal sense of the word, since his mother was Spanish, but it was the language he had used since adolescence, the language he operated in daily. Frederick's main and preferred language, the language he used in his poetry, was Sicilian Italian. Formal letters between the two were likely in Latin, if produced by their respective chancellors. One can only assume that some things were simply lost in translation. The imperial princes were quickly wisening to the fact that father and son were at odds about strategy. So when Henry clamped down on their positions, they simply wrote to Frederick, and he reversed his son's decisions. This was humiliating, for Henry was, after all, a king, not any odd king, but the king of the Romans and the future emperor. His authority was being eroded by his own father, a father who he believed simply did not understand the situation in Germany and what was needed to bring the empire back to its former glory. Meanwhile, the father despaired of the son, who was unable to see the bigger picture, who could not get his head round the fact that Germany was only one part of the all-encompassing empire and that the battlefield was Lombardy. A further humiliation for Henry came when he tried to divorce his wife, the daughter of the Austrian duke, in order to marry Agnes of Bohemia. His father denied him that because he needed Austria for his plans in Italy, whilst he had no use for Bohemia. 
As Henry's relationship with his father is gradually deteriorating, his position vis-à-vis -vis the princes is collapsing. In 1230, he granted wide-ranging autonomy to his allies, the cities. In particular, he allowed them to elect their city councils, without having to seek permission first from the bishop or the secular territorial lord, and he allowed them to form city leagues. In January 1231, at a royal assembly, the princes came together and issued a verdict, rendering Henry's previous grant null and void. They banned the cities from forming associations and made the members of the city councils dependent upon prior approval of their territorial lord. That verdict was then written up and issued by the royal chancery as if it had come from Henry himself. Henry was seemingly unable to prevent this from happening, though I could not find a detailed explanation of why and how. Emboldened by their success in May 1231, the princes did the same thing again, but now went for the whole gambit. Once again, they made Henry issue a royal charter, a charter that transfers all remaining regalia, i.e. the right to issue coins, to demand tariffs and tolls, to hold court, to build castles or to found new cities to the princes. The ecclesiastical princes already enjoyed such rights thanks to Frederick's golden bull from 1220. And it may be true that most of the temporal princes held similar rights before on the basis of individual privileges, but with this decision, every imperial prince automatically enjoys what is essentially freedom from imperial interference. The emperor recedes from direct ruler to a mediated ruler who acts through the imperial princes. For Henry, this was a political catastrophe and he blamed his father's reluctance to support him for it. For December 1231, Frederick calls an imperial assembly in Ravenna, inviting all his vassals in Italy, Burgundy and Germany to come together. But only a few princes show up, since Verona had closed the Brenner Pass. What infuriated Frederick most was that his son did not come, and did, did not even make an effort to come down. Frederick now has to set a new date for the royal assembly, this time in Aquileia, much closer to Germany. He makes it abundantly clear that he expects his son to put in an appearance. Henry cannot hold out any longer and indeed shows up in northern Italy. There he is subjected to an even deeper humiliation. He is not allowed to enter the city of Aquileia before he has publicly asked his father for forgiveness and after swearing total obedience to him. Frederick renews the ordinance from 1231 that granted the territorial princes the freedom to do as they liked within their territory. Henry has to swear to treat the princes as lights and protectors of the empire and apples of the emperor's eye. To round it up, he makes Henry write to the Pope that if he, Henry, should in any way disrespect his father's wishes, the Pope was to automatically excommunicate him. Henry is 20 years old. What do you think a 20-year-old does after treatment like that? Exactly. Apples of my father's eye, you got it coming. Henry returns to Germany. He tears up all the ordinances he did not like, grants the citizens of Worms the right to form a city council, and allows them to enter into leagues of cities if they so wished. Bang. Automatic excommunication. He has some friends amongst the bishops. A smattering of princes, some cities and members of the lower nobility join him. Not exactly the greatest of rebellions, but not nothing. He treats it as a feud, as a message to his father that his treatment is unacceptable. At no point is he realistically able, or does he want to overthrow his father. When his father does not yield to what he believes are his rightful demands, he has to up the ante. He thrusts a knife into the heart of his father's policies. He forms an alliance with the Lombard League. That's it. In 1235, Frederick II comes to Germany to sort everything out. Did he take an army to subdue his rebellious son? No. As the chronicler said, he progressed with the utmost pomp. Many chariots followed him laden with gold and silver, with byssus and with purple, with gems and costly vessels. He had with him camels, dromedars, apes and leopards, with Saracens and dark-skinned Ethiopians, 
skilled in the art of many kinds, who served as guards for his money and his treasure. He had barely crossed into Bavaria before the German princes flocked to his banner. But they were in awe of the display of his menagerie and the exotic attendants, or more likely the lure of gold and silver, they hoped would replenish their empty coffers. Well, we leave that to history. Suffice to say, Henry's rebellion collapsed within days, and he had to sue for his father's forgiveness. Being brought up in German society of the 13th century, he expected his father to sternly reprimand him and then make him undergo a ritual submission. But once that is done, he will be left in peace and he will retain his position. Right? That is how conflict resolution was done in the German lands ever since time immemorial. You remember Otto the Great, not just forgiving his brother Henry two rebellions and an assassination attempt, but making him Duke of Bavaria. Even Conrad II, the most warlike of emperors, forgave his son Henry III his disobedience. Henry attempted to throw himself at his father's feet at the Pfalz of Wimpfen, but he was not led into the imperial presence. Instead, he was carried along to Worms as a prisoner. There in Worms, after a few days of confinement, he was finally led into the audience hall. Now he threw himself on the floor, crying and begging for forgiveness for his sins. His father did not move a muscle. He left his son just lying there. Seconds stretched into minutes. The German nobles watched in bewilderment. The normal process was for the emperor to allow his son to rise again, but no. Finally, some of the princes could not stand it any longer that their king was still prostrate and intervened on his behalf. After even more delay, his father finally gave him the order to stand up. Henry again backed forgiveness, promised to give up all his possessions and renounce the crown for now and forever. Another final misunderstanding. In southern Italy, there was only one resolution for high treason. Death. Henry's alliance with the Lombard League, that was high treason. And Frederick was a Sicilian who will apply Sicilian justice. The verdict was high treason. Only Henry's renunciation of the crown saved his life. Frederick was prepared to commute his sentence from death to life imprisonment. Henry was brought to Sicily, first to a castle near Melfi. Six years later he was moved to Nicastro. There he fell ill with disease, probably leprosy. In 1242, during another transfer, Henry rode his horse off a cliff. He was 30 years of age. He was buried in the church of Cosenza in a marble sarcophagus clad in a shroud of gold and silver into which eagles' feathers were woven. A Franciscan preached the final sermon and chose as his text, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Frederick surely mourned his son's death. In the letter ordering the details of the funeral, he wrote, quote, the pity of a tender father must yield to the judgment of the stern judge. We mourn the doom of our firstborn. Nature bids flow the flood of tears, but they are checked by the pain of injury and the inflexibility of justice. End quote. Did he have the choice to forgive his son? One would have thought so, given other examples where forgiveness had worked. But for that, Frederick would have to understand and trust his son and his son would have had to grasp his father's strategy. But they both did not. And now one of them is dead. So dead he is almost written out of history. Numerically, he would have been Henry VII. But there is another Henry VII in the early 14th century. So this Henry is known as Henry der Klammersiebte, Henry VII in brackets. A name most apt for his position bracketed in between imperial princes and his father, his ambition and his inability to communicate it. Next week, we'll talk a bit more about the impact this privilege to the princes had on the constitution of the Holy Roman Empire. Plus, Frederick issues some more laws, makes an interesting verdict and marries an English rose that he will send into his harem to wither away like all her predecessors. I hope you will join us again. Before I go, let me thank all of you who are supporting the show, in particular the patrons who have kindly signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans. It is thanks to you that this show does not have to do advertising for mattresses 
or as I recently heard, energy supplements and pension plans. If Patreon isn't for you, another way to help the show is sharing the podcast directly or boosting its recognition on social media. If you share, comment or retweet posts from the history of the Germans, it's more likely to be seen by others and bring in more listeners. My most active places are Twitter, at Germans History, and my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. As always, all the links are in the show notes. <laughs>